This is Ken Johnson with another episode of SetCast. In today's episode, we discuss cross-site scripting and how it manifests in the Ruby on Rails framework. Additionally, we show attacking the vulnerability as well as fixing the problem. So let's get started. If you're not familiar with cross-site scripting, this vulnerability essentially relates to rendering back user-supplied input in an unsafe way, allowing an attacker to modify the page's JavaScript or HTML or CSS content. So we're going to go ahead and show you what cross-site scripting looks like. Um, we're going to use the registration page of railsgo.dev, fill in all the appropriate information, but pay special attention to the first name field. You'll notice that we enter in an alert box in JavaScript. And you'll see that that JavaScript executes. It's an alert box with the number one. This means the site is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. If we take a look in the source code, you can see that the script tags are rendered without any encoding. So the browser interprets our input as code and executes it. So really we have an encoding problem as well as an input validation problem. We are going to do something a little bit different for a few moments here. Instead of only showing how the vulnerability manifests itself as well as fixing cross-site scripting, we want to show the impact. To do that, we're going to leverage a tool named Beef. This framework was built to exploit these cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and allow an attacker to use a cross-site scripting vulnerability to perform other malicious actions. So I'm going to go ahead and fire up beef. You'll notice that there are several URLs provided, one of which is the UI URL. This is for administrative management of the browser exploitation framework. In essence, this provides an attacker with a way to remotely manage and interact with their victim who is hooked into beef through the use of a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So we're logged into Beef now, and you'll notice that there is a demo page link. You can use this demo page to simulate attacking a client leveraging cross-site scripting. For our purposes, we'll demonstrate using this cross-site scripting vulnerability by changing the first name to document.location equals the location of the beef demo page. This will give us an initial hook into the victim's browser so that we can interact with their browser and in our case, steal photos off their webcam. When we navigate to our dashboard, we are redirected immediately to the demonstration page for beef. So this means we are now a victim of cross-site scripting and we are hooked into beef. And as we navigate to the attacker's UI panel, we see that our IP, our machine, is now hooked into beef. The first thing we're going to test is to send a simple alert to the browser just to see if beef is indeed working. So we will change the text to this is a setcast tutorial, navigate to the victim's browser, and sure enough, the command did execute. So now we want to try something just a little bit different. We're going to navigate to the browser folder and webcam command. And in essence, this is going to allow us to enable screen grabs from the user's webcam so that we can see whatever their webcam allows us to see. We've set a message that the user will see and that they will have to accept. We'll take 20 pictures and we'll do this every second. Now we can change that message to be whatever we want, but ultimately we do require the user to accept it. Once they've accepted the Adobe Flash Player settings, we begin taking pictures. When those pictures are taken, that data is returned to us as a base64 encoded string. We will have to convert that base64 encoded string to an actual JPEG to view it. So in order to do that, we open the Beef database with SQLite browser, navigate to the data, save it to a text file, 
and then convert that text file to a JPEG. When this data is pasted into the text file, it requires a little bit of cleanup, so we'll go ahead and do that now. And then we'll have to save the file, navigate to the command line, perform a base64 decoding operation, and then output that result into a JPEG file. And as you can see, we have a JPEG that shows that we are pwned. So that's sort of the impact of cross-site scripting. It goes a bit deeper than just being an alert box. So going back to the generated code for a moment, the generated HTML code, you'll notice again the script tags. But in addition to that, notice that the comments mention that they use HTML safe. This is important. We want to take a look at the code and show you the HTML safe method. We basically take the current user, their first name, and we call HTML safe. It's important to note that HTML safe is not at all safe. It's actually a very dangerous method and can lead to cross-site scripting. To expand upon that, we've opened up the active support gem code, and you'll notice that HTML safe is really a wrapper for active support safe buffer. This class, as you go through it, this is not a this is not code designed to safely output your content so much as it allows us to safely concatenate values. So again, from a security perspective, this doesn't really necessarily help us protect against cross-site scripting. So we're going to go ahead and just remove that method and view the output the application generates after having removed that HTML safe method. And you'll notice that script alert one is shown and that in the source code, the malicious characters, the greater than, less than, those are safely HTML encoded. Natively, Rails will perform this HTML encoding, and if you need to mix some HTML content but not allow others, consider using the sanitize method within Rails. So we're going to discuss another form of cross-site scripting known as DOM cross-site scripting, or DOM XSS. DOM XSS occurs when user input is then incorporated into some document object model attribute. When this is performed and the content is not safely encoded, the result is a cross-site scripting vulnerability. To demonstrate this vulnerability in action, we're going to send a GET request to our Rails Goat application. In the URL, there will be a test equals value. Note the pound test that you'll see in the URL. This is a value that's going to be extracted via JavaScript and appended to a document object model attribute. If we look at the JavaScript code, you'll notice that we split the URL by the equal sign and that provides us with two values, test and the value of test, in this case script alert 1234. So script alert 1234 is represented by param value. Param value is written to the DOM, so it's document.write. And this is done without first encoding that value. So anything the user enters will be rendered and interpreted by the browser exactly as it was written. We are going to navigate to the application.js file. Within this file, we've copied the relevant escape routine from Hogan.js. We're going to go ahead and copy this code and paste it in the same file as the vulnerable JavaScript. Instead of directly rendering param value, we are going to first escape that value and then render the escaped value. We'll go ahead and create a variable named escaped val and call the Hogan escape routine on param value and instead of performing a document.write on param value, we will perform document.write on escaped value. Let's go ahead and try this again. You'll notice that the alert did not execute. We want to look at the generated HTML code. And when we look at this code, we note that the potentially malicious HTML characters such as less than and greater than are HTML encoded. 
The next thing I want to briefly discuss is a vulnerability that occurs within Rails 3. When rendering JSON content using methods such as to underscore JSON, the expectation is that that content will be safely encoded. However, the native configuration within application.rb does not work and the setting is ignored. So for instance, if you have JavaScript that is consuming JSON that is provided in a response from your application, you could very well have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So there are a couple ways to fix this, but we'll show you uh, one way. You can change the previous configuration setting to active support colon colon escape HTML entities in JSON, and that will correct the problem. This last example of cross-site scripting is a little bit different in that it occurs within a CSS context. The application provides us with the ability to change our font size. And this is done using a font equals parameter and value. When we view the source code generated by the application, we can see that our value 200 has been placed within the CSS. So we're going to try to do something a little bit different than intended and change our background color. So we're going to perform a little URL encoding, copy the URL, and place it into the application. And it worked. If we view the source code, you can see that the entirety of our input has been rendered back within the HTML code. The important thing to note here is just that cross-site scripting can occur in context you may not previously have known about. You can leverage methods such as sanitize and sanitize underscore CSS to be very deliberate or particular in what content you allow to be rendered by your application. I'm Ken Johnson. This is another episode of SetCast. Thanks for watching.